welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, a springtime sojourn in Yellowstone, presented by wildlife biologist Aaron Bott. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Aaron. Thank you, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, this, I think, is a very appropriate presentation to offer to us all over the world. Um, this is a kind of the time of year that we're looking forward to, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, seeing the flowers pop out and uh, seeing April and May showers pass through, um, especially here in the Northern Rocky Mountains where we have a colorful display of wildflowers popping out. And we've got a whole bunch of animals that are giving birth to their babies. It's, it's just a really exciting time. Um, so I thought I would put a presentation together for anyone who is interested in knowing what's going on in Yellowstone at this time of year. Uh, this is going to be helpful for you if you're planning on traveling with NetHab to Yellowstone in the springtime. Um, but if you're not traveling with NetHab to Yellowstone in the springtime, then you can jump on board this presentation and kind of experience visually what is going on in the world's first national park at this time of year. So we will have, as Rob said, some questions and answers uh, at the end of our presentation. So if there's anything you're specifically interested in um, about visiting Yellowstone, um, you can save your questions or type your questions in and, and we'll get to those at the conclusion of today's presentation. Um, by way of introduction, I'm a wildlife biologist. I've grown up in Yellowstone um, my whole life. My family's been uh, in the Yellowstone region for the last six generations of our family. Uh, I specialize in large carnivore biology, specifically with wolves, but I've also worked with uh, a whole a whole host of other uh, native wildlife species from the Yellowstone area and in the American West. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to share with you some of the happenings, some of the natural wonders that you can expect to see in the Yellowstone country at this time of year. Now, to give us a little bit of a background, Yellowstone is the world's first national park. It was created in 1872 on March 1st. Um, it was made the first national park rather than a state park because at the time that Yellowstone was created and preserved, uh, in the Ulysses S. Grant administration, there were just territories in this part of the American West. Um, if Montana had been a state at the time, if Wyoming had been a state at the time, or Idaho had been a state at the time, it's likely that Yellowstone would have been a state park. Um, that's what happened to Yosemite. Yosemite was created as a public park before Yellowstone, but it was within the state of California. And so it was firstly made as a state park and only after Yellowstone had set the standard of national parks um, did Yosemite later convert into a national park. Um, but Yellowstone is essentially a 2.2 million acre wilderness that is protected by the U.S. Department of the Interior um, the National Park Service was created in 1916. So I've given several presentations on the history of Yellowstone and how it's evolved as an idea over the last century and a half. Um, but understand that when Yellowstone was first created, it was preserved to um, celebrate the geological oddities of this particular area. Today, when we go to Yellowstone, many people go to see the wildlife, but back in the 1870s, the idea was to protect Yellowstone's geothermal basins. And today, we often refer to the Yellowstone country, which doesn't just include Yellowstone National Park, which you see here on this map, but it actually is in reference to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which includes Grand Teton National Park, just a few miles to the south of Yellowstone. It was created in 1950 as a national park, but also the surrounding country, um, the Wind River Range, the Gallatins, the Absorcas, and uh, 
millions of acres of national forest service land. Um, this entire ecosystem is celebrated and known as the last intact temperate ecosystem in the world, meaning that it has the four seasons and everything that should be here is still here. Um, unfortunately, we have some things that are here that ought not to be here, some invasive species as well. But we still have the bison, the elk, the moose, the grizzly bears, the wolves, the wolverines, everything that was here when uh, Lewis and Clark first crossed the continent back in 1804 to 1805. And those animals can still be found all here in this in this particular corner of the world, which makes it very interesting and unique. Um, to see where it's at on the map, this is kind of a zoomed out view that shows that Yellowstone, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, is the southernmost point of the northern Rocky Mountain Cordillera. So there's a chain of Rocky Mountains that extend from uh, northwestern Wyoming all the way up essentially to the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Um, this big cordillera, this big chain of mountains is known as the Northern Rocky Mountain Range. And Yellowstone's ecosystem is on the southernmost tip of that. Uh, it's tucked away in the northwest corner of Wyoming, primarily, um, but it also extends up into southwestern Montana and southeastern Idaho. And you can see here, just to get your bearings, that you've got the Great Salt Lake in Utah, just to the bottom left of the Yellowstone ecosystem. And then down in the bottom right-hand corner, you have the Southern Rockies, which is uh, in Colorado and the Colorado Plateau, just adjacent to that. And the Yellowstone ecosystem butts right up against the Great Plains. So Yellowstone is a temperate ecosystem, as I already said. It's got all four seasons. And it's a pretty unique landscape because Yellowstone, as I said, was first created due to its, um, due to the celebration of its geologic oddities, these very large geyser basins, these thermal basins that are peppered throughout the park. Um, there are more geysers in Yellowstone than anywhere else in the world. And this is because Yellowstone is a volcano. Um, underneath the continent, we have a large thermal magma plume, which is commonly referred to as a hot spot. And this large hot spot, this big chamber of magma, elevates the landscape, um, creating a massive uh, volcanic plateau that in the last two million years has erupted three times. And this volcano is the largest known volcano on Earth. Um, when it has erupted, uh, particularly two million years ago, it produced 6,000 times as much volcanic material as the eruption of, Sound, of Saint, Mount St. Helens, excuse me. So that just kind of puts things into perspective. But historically, this large hot spot has erupted multiple times in the last 16 to 17 million years. And as the large North American continent drifts over this, this magma chamber, um, these eruptions kind of leave scars across the American West. So in the next 50, or excuse me, this, the next 5 million years, Yellowstone will probably drift on up into um, central Montana, and then who knows where it will go from there based off of the trajectory of the continent. So Yellowstone is, again, a, a temperate ecosystem. And it's at a high elevation, higher than most of the surrounding company or surrounding country. Excuse me, I'm getting tongue-tied. Because of the thermal activity, the volcanic activity underneath, and also because it's a part of the northern Rocky Mountains. So the average elevation of Yellowstone is generally six to seven to eight thousand feet, but the peaks get in the ecosystem get above thirteen thousand feet. Um, and this really adds a whole layer of interesting dynamics to the, the environment and also the snow and the, uh, the water runoff and therefore the wildlife as well. 
So we're going to be focusing on what Yellowstone is like in springtime and what you can expect when you travel to Yellowstone at this time of year. Well, to begin with, Yellowstone, as I said, is high in elevation and it typically gets severe winters with a lot of snowpack. And so Yellowstone National Park has a designated winter season, which runs essentially from December 15th-ish until March 15th-ish. And then there are shoulder seasons when the park is essentially closed to the public. And that's because the roads are just uh, impassable. So when the park closes in the fall, generally around the middle of October to the 1st of November, um, snow accumulates on the park roads. And then when enough snow has accumulated, then the winter season begins and you can access the majority of Yellowstone using snow coaches, which you can travel in if you visit Yellowstone with natural habitat adventures in the winter, or on snowmobiles. Um, but as soon as March comes, the snow starts to melt and the roads are no longer maintained for winter travel. And generally the park doesn't open until the first to the middle of May. And at that time, the roads are then passable and the public can start to drive through the park. Now, I need to put a little footnote here and explain that the Lamar Valley in Northeastern Yellowstone National Park is drivable with a vehicle, a motorized vehicle year round. And that is because the roads are well maintained because the communities of Silvergate and Cook City need to have access to Gardner, Montana and Bozeman, Montana. So those roads remain open um, throughout the year, even in the dead of winter. Um, but at any other time of year, if you wanna visit the park, you gotta wait until the roads are clear. So that usually happens in the middle of, uh, or the first to the middle of May. And because of the high elevation, snow persists typically in the mountains for a significant amount of time. And you can still experience blizzards that randomly show up throughout May and June and even into July. I've had many a blizzard in July, um, which is kind of fun and unusual. Uh, but the spring in Yellowstone, because of its elevation, generally starts a bit later than it does on the lower plains and in the lower elevations. So when we start thinking about springtime in April, you have to realize that they're about a month behind us. Um, so right now, it's kind of like April here in the middle of May. It's like the middle of April up in Yellowstone National Park, and it can still be cold. So you need to bundle up and bring your coats and kind of expect the unexpected. And as the snow melts and comes off of the high elevation peaks, the waters flow down through the rivers, through the Gallatin, the Snake River, and the Madison, and ultimately the Yellowstone Rivers. And this high water flow can change the overall um, geothermal features on the landscape. Yellowstone is most popularly celebrated and known for uh, Old Faithful, which in the Upper Geyser Basin goes off at predictable intervals. but what I think a lot of people don't realize is that when the water table is highest because of spring runoff, Old Faithful's schedule shifts slightly because again, the water table under the volcanic and rhyolitic soiled crust shifts. And so Old Faithful goes off typically more frequently in the springtime than it does at any other time of year. And this is again because all of this water is sloughing off of the mountains and running through the park and draining across hundreds of waterfalls that are peppered across the volcanic plateau. The wildlife, meanwhile, are getting ready for um, an abundant time of year. Uh, most of these animals are trudging through deep snow. They're struggling to make a living, at least the herbivores are, and they are desperate and excited to have a shift in the weather. They're ready to get some grass into their bellies 
because at this time of year, many of the animals are pregnant. They're expecting and they need to get the nutrition um, that they require in order to support their offspring. And we'll get a little bit more into that in just a minute. But the nutrition comes in the form of green up. There is a phenologic cycle, which is just a fancy way of saying um, there is a, a seasonal change in the ve vegetation as Yellowstone moves from winter into spring and into summer. And the first of the flowers that really pop out in almost like a firework display uh, start blooming in the lower uh, meadow valleys of Yellowstone. But as the park begins to warm, then those flowers surf kind of in a wave-like fashion up into the higher elevations. And the wildlife ultimately will follow this pattern. They call it surfing the green wave. So animals want the green vegetation, which is high in nitrogen, which is a building block for proteins that the animals require in order to replenish uh, their diminished strength and nutritional reservoirs after a long winter. Some of the first flowers to pop up are spring beauties, which you can see there in the bottom, or, or the very bottom uh, right-hand corner there. Um, spring beauties are edible. They're, they produce a, a bulb. You can dig them up and eat them, but they're small. The Shoshone peoples who inhabited this area for a long time uh, were always celebrating the, the blooming of spring beauties as a sign of spring so that they could begin their annual harvest of the other uh, tubers and bulbs that were coming after that. Um, we also have an abundant supply of blooming glacier lilies, which you can see in the middle photograph there, those yellow lilies, which uh, also produce large bulbs, which are great for consumption. We have uh, camas lilies, we have biscuit root, we have mule's ear and balsam root, a whole variety of flowers really um, give us a spectacular display of Yellowstone beginning in May and persisting through the middle to the end of July, depending on the elevation. And this picture here in this cross-section map shows you kind of the elevation of the Yellowstone range and gives you an idea of just how varying it can be uh, based on not only the volcanic plateau, but the surrounding mountain ranges. And again, this is very important for wildlife because this gives them a variety of opportunities to continue to um, exploit and consume those vegetative resources throughout the year. Um, again, replenishing their body reserves and helping them to support their offspring. And with the change in vegetation, of course, we get some of our earliest um, our earliest wildlife returning to the Yellowstone ecosystem, some of them having been absent for many months. So the birds are the first that really start to make an appearance. And some of these birds that call the Yellowstone ecosystem their home travel a great distance at other times of year, including the osprey and the Swainson's hawk, which travel all the way down through South America to central Argentina um, some of them living there in the winter and then migrating back up to the Yellowstone ecosystem to spend their summers. Um, we have a lot of birds, including our golden eagles and our bald eagles in April, begin to um, make nests. A lot of these uh, bird species are laying eggs, and it's just really a, a fascinating display of aerial tenacity as all of these creatures come back to their summer homes. Um, also something that is a spectacular thing to observe if you're there early enough is the lek of the sage grouse, which takes place in mid-April. Sage grouse going out on their mating rituals and uh, you can hear them uh, thumping the grounds all over the valleys. It's a pretty incredible display and it's exciting because the birds, like the flowers, add a wide variety of colors to the landscape. It's a great place to go when you're um, ready to, to get out of your winter cabin and do some birding. Now, the larger species on the landscape are also beginning to move. 
Um, all of our ungulates in the Yellowstone ecosystem have migrations to some degree. And the most uh, famous of these is the migration of the large elk herds that live in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And here we have a map that kind of shows you where all the different elk herds migrate and move across the landscape during the winter. So if you've been to Yellowstone's area before, you know that outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, to the south there, is the National Elk Refuge, about a 27,000 acre wildlife refuge for wintering elk. And the elk come out of the high foothills of the Yellowstone and the Grovants and the Tetons, and they winter there in numbers that range from seven to 9,000. And then when the snow begins to recede, these elk push their way back up into the foothills and into the plateaus where they'll spend the rest of their year. Um, especially these large matriarchal herds um, that are getting ready to give birth to their calves. And not only do we have elk moving on the landscape, but we also have, have uh, bighorn sheep and pronghorn and mule deer. Mule deer um, moving all the way from southeastern, excuse me, southwestern Wyoming's uh, red desert up into the Yellowstone country, 150 miles which is the largest known mule deer migration in the world coming up into the Yellowstone country again for all of its resources. But I like this map here. It shows just how wide and how, from how far these elk are coming. The Sand Creek elk herd, the Black Tail herd, the Madison Valley, the Clark's Fork, um, from all over this ecosystem, elk are migrating into the park because of, again, the phenologic cycle of the vegetation surfing the green wave. Also at this time of year, uh, these large deer species, the moose, the elk, the mule deer, the white-tailed deer are all shedding their antlers. And a few weeks ago, I gave a presentation on antlers and kind of the life cycle, the life history of, of antler production. And you can go watch that if you're interested in more detail. But all deer produce um, a bony protrusion from the tops of their heads in the male um, animals, except for caribou, which don't live in this area. Males and females both produce antlers in that species. But all the males grow these large bones, and every year they shed these bones, which is a pretty remarkable feat. So depending on the species, moose beginning it, um, moose start to shed their antlers typically in December and mule deer and white-tailed deer start to drop their antlers in January and into February and then elk they drop their antlers the last in March into the first of April. These large again um, secondary sexual characteristic traits that grow um, up to 20 pounds each on the elk um, uh, get cast off and they're shed into the environment and you can start to notice that all of your bulls and all of your bucks are no longer perhaps looking as regal as they drop these large antlers. But right after they drop their antlers, they immediately start to grow another pair of antlers for the upcoming breeding season, which takes place in the fall. So it's this really remarkable, again, secondary sexual character characteristic um, process for sexual selection in these animals where they're growing these very expensive, nutritionally expensive antlers just to show off, to get an opportunity to breed with the females later on in the fall season. And these antlers, when they're growing, are highly innervated and uh, they've got uh, sensitivity, nerve endings, they've got blood flowing through these really soft uh, growing bones that are covered in a velvet tissue, this skin tissue that provides the circulation that the antler bones need in order to grow throughout the spring and into the summer. And these antlers require a lot of calcium and phosphorus, just like all bones, so much so that some of these large bulls can actually experience osteoporosis 
while they're growing their antlers. They're actually robbing their own skeletons of the minerals that their bones need in order to produce these large, magnificent antlers. And uh, they can grow up to over an inch a day. They're the fastest growing vertebrate cell known in the animal kingdom, which is pretty remarkable. Even faster than cancer cells do they develop and grow. Um, so they're growing right now. So you can't go out to Yellowstone expecting to see large trophy bull elk or bull moose or bucks. Um, they're all going to be kind of in this stage, in this phase. Now, bison are the largest land animal in North America. The bulls can live or can weigh over 2,000 pounds. The females are a dainty 1,000 pounds, but they grow these large horns that are not cast. They're grown on both sexes and they persist on the animal's head for the entirety of the animal's life. But Yellowstone is celebrated for its iconic bison population. Um, bison once roamed across North America in the tens of millions, but were exterminated almost completely in the mid to late 19th century, with the exception of a small population in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Just a couple dozen, or excuse me, yeah, two dozen were left. So about 22 bison were left on the, on the landscape after approximately 10, or ex, excuse me, after approximately 30 million had ranged across the Great Plains. Um, there were several uh, small bison herds that managed to escape in northern Canada as well. But really this animal had almost completely been annihilated. And fortunately, due to uh, very strict and rigorous uh, conservation work, the bison population all over North America has recovered and it is no longer endangered. Although it has lost most of its historic range, the species is not going to go extinct, which is a great thing. So in Yellowstone, we have, depending on the time of year, generally three to 5,000 bison ranging across Yellowstone National Park. And again, these are the largest land animals in North America, and they are a pretty, pretty remarkable creature to see on the landscape. But iconically, beginning at the end of April and in the first of May, uh, bison calves are dropping. And these are lovingly referred to as red dogs because these newborn calves show up in a bright red coat. And uh, again, really a, a great time of year to get out and to photograph these animals and their mass migrations moving across, especially the, the lower elevation areas of the uh, Paradise Valley, Gardner Valley excuse me, and moving back up into Lamar Valley where you can see all of these thousands of animals moving and living. And then you quickly get into the calving and fawning season of the mule deer and the white-tailed deer and eventually the elk beginning in June. Um, but these beautiful animals all dropping their babies on the landscape, so vulnerable and uh, really unprotected for the first several days of their life hiding out in the bushes, hoping that predators don't come by, um, but ultimately replenishing the, the population after a long winter with much winter kill. In response to the vegetation surge and the abundance and the growing population of your herbivores, your predators also have a breeding cycle, which pulsates based on the seasonality of the year. So wolves have a 63 day gestation period and unlike domestic dogs, wolves only breed one time of year. So they breed in February at this latitude in Yellowstone National Park. And then they whelp or they give birth to their pups in April, mid-April. So here we are in the middle of May. So we've got pups that are on the landscape about a month old at this time. And wolves are uh, communal, uh, excuse me, they're cooperative breeders. They're a group of animals that work together as a family unit. We call them packs, where a male and a female breed typically for life and they raise their pups. Um, generally, they'll whelp four to six pups at a time, 
and the pups will remain with the pack generally for the first two years of their life until they're sexually mature at two years of age, at which time they disperse and they go off to try and find their own mate and they try and establish their own territory. But the reason why these carnivores are reproducing and whelping at this time of year is because just like springtime is the perfect time of year for the un for the herbivores to give birth, giving their young an opportunity to live off of the fatty milk of their mothers while their mothers are gorging on the green vegetation. Um, the predators, the carnivores, are also giving birth at this time because they take advantage of all those baby herbivores on the landscape. And so by gobbling them up, they get fat and they can also produce a lot of fatty milk for their offspring as well. So if you go to Yellowstone, let's see, it's May right now. You probably have a couple more weeks, but the wolf pups will start emerging from their den and uh, they will be with their uh, natal den for the first couple of months of their life before the pack relocates to a rendezvous site where the adults in the pack help to raise the offspring um, together as a pack before they eventually become completely mobile in September and October. And then the pack is off hunting for the rest of the year until the cycle begins all over again. Bears are another very charismatic species and the best time to see them is in the springtime. Generally, the males are emerging from their hibernation, typically in March, but into April as well. They're the first generally to emerge from their dens, and they come out and they look pretty haggard, a bit rough. Um, what's remarkable, though, about bears is their ability to retain muscle mass and avoid um, osteoporosis while they are hibernating. They go for five months plus without eating or drinking or urinating or defecating, and yet their bodies have such a remarkable capability, um, metabolic capability of retaining their muscle mass and avoiding um, poisoning themselves with the concentration of nitrogen that we would require to pass through our, our bodies, um, that they, just pop out of their dens hungry and a little bit cantankerous perhaps. So the big boars, the big males go out on the landscape and they look to scavenge winter killed animals, um, but also they begin to, to try and gorge themselves on as much vegetation as possible. But bears actually emerge from their dens having lost a significant amount of fat, significant amount of, of weight, and after emerging from their dens, they don't really fatten up again until late summer, early fall. So they will continue to get leaner and meaner as the spring progresses. And that is because bears are primarily scavengers and foragers, um, foraging off of uh, uh, roots and tubers and, and berries. And they're not getting the right amount of carbs and proteins in order to fatten them up. Um, in the springtime. So they're kind of cantankerous and looking for food wherever they can get it. The females, and this is a black bear, uh, but they basically kind of have the same life cycle. Um, the females generally don't emerge from their dens until a bit later. Uh, typically, if they've given birth, it's not until May and or late April. And that is because they stay within the den a little bit longer to keep their Newborn cubs, well protected. Um, bears, both grizzlies and black bears, have a very interesting reproductive life cycle. Um, they have what's known as delayed implantation. So the males and females actually breed in June and in July, um, but the females do not technically uh, become impregnated until they go into hibernation. Generally for black bears, this is around um, October, and for grizzly bears, it's around Thanksgiving. Um, so this delayed implantation allows um, the blastocyst to remain floating within the uterus uh, until the female's body has acquired enough fat reserves for it to then implant in the uterine wall, at which time she um, 
gestates for about for about eight weeks and then she gives birth typically in January, the middle of January. And the cubs are born at about a pound, naked, hairless, blind, and and bawling, but they will pop out of the den with her in May, weighing about 20 to 30 pounds. So putting on a significant amount of weight just from her rich fat milk. So it's a really remarkable um, reproductive story that bears have. And typically black bears will give birth to two or three cubs. Grizzly bears have a slower reproductive cycle and generally it's one or two cubs. Uh, but in some cases we get three, just like in this beautiful picture of a sow with her three cubs. Um, unfortunately, the mortality rate for all young animals, whether they're herbivores or carnivores, is pretty high. Only about 50% of your babies survive their first year due to just about anything you can imagine, from accidents like falling down cliffs and off of boulders to being attacked by other animals. But again, bears, I think, are are really iconic, especially in Yellowstone, because you see so much bear activity as these animals are emerging from their dens. The moms have their young, they'll keep their young with them for several years, depending on the species. Grizzly bears typically keep their cubs with them for two and a half to even three years. Um, but it's just a great time to see these animals out and about foraging off of the vegetative resources that, that are in the Yellowstone ecosystem. So here you have the carnivores, which are subsisting off of various ungulate prey, um, such as newborn elk calves, but also we have fish and your Yellowstone cutthroat trout begin to spawn, usually in June and into July. Um, and this is another great resource for bears and other animals such as otter and eagles to forage on in order to make a living because that's what everything's about, right? It's, Springtime is, is a sudden green up and a replenishing of food resources for all of these animals in order for them to fatten up and get ready for the next upcoming winter. But that's kind of the summary of what you can expect to see if you're wildlife watching in Yellowstone. Uh, if you visit the park at this time of year, it's really a magnificent time to go. Again, because of the, the wildflowers and the young animals and all of the activity and kind of the the celebration of life that's taking place across the world's first national park, as in other areas of the Northern Hemisphere at this time of year. But it is a, a great time to go to Yellowstone. And with that, I will take questions if there are any. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in the control panel. All right, so can you tell us what change in the animal's physiology leads to the drop of the antlers? It would seem to be less taxing to maintain the antlers and maybe use them as a defense system. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, that's great. And I would definitely recommend that if you're interested in antlers to, to watch that presentation I gave a couple weeks ago. But antler oogenesis is the technical term for the growth and production of antlers is all based off of hormones, particularly testosterone. So as testosterone levels begin to spike, antler production increases, antlers grow to the point that the live and growing antler becomes a dead bone. And then you rub all of that velvet off, you use it um, to help compete with other males for the opportunity to breed, usually it's a visual stimulant rather than actually a combative uh, product. That's what antlers are typically used for. But right after the breeding season takes place in the fall, testosterone levels drop, and this causes a demineralization process along what's known as the pedicel, which is a kind of a unique organ at the top of the skull or, or near the cranium of these animals. So uh, to maintain the antler on your head, it does seem like it would be a lot easier, right? It's it's kind of a, boy, what a cycle, you know? This is sometimes referred to as runaway selection theory, where uh, you have a, a characteristic about you 
that is very attractive to a certain species, or excuse me, to a certain sex, in this case the females, um, probably because it shows the fitness of the animal. It's an indicator of the fitness of the males. If they can produce big symmetrical antlers, that means that he's fit. And so the females will be more inclined to breed with him. Um, but due to evolution and natural selection, the antlers continue to get bigger over time. And generally this can uh, begin to negatively impact the individual's life. And getting rid of those antlers is sometimes a relief because they get tangled up in things. Um, they can be problematic because, uh, yeah, it just costs a lot of energy to even keep them on, not just to grow them. So antlers are really cool. Unfortunately, that's the last question that we do have for today. So I'm going to throw it back to you for your closing comments. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, again, if you haven't been to Yellowstone in the spring, I encourage that you go. And if you can't make it there anytime soon, then hopefully this gave you a little taste of what's going on in the environment at this time of year. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.